And the Citadel Gray Line is back with you here as we walk through the next hour all about Citadel Bulldog football. And we've got Citadel Bulldog basketball to talk about in a big way. Duger Balcom, head coach of the Citadel basketball team, is going to be on with us. And we're going to talk about his Bulldog basketball team getting ready, what we hope will be as many games as possible in a 2021 SOCON slate. We'll get the full report on all that right here on Citadel Gray Line. I'm John Rawl. Good to have you back here as we do welcome you in on this program that's presented in part by IPS Packaging and Automation. And also, we don't want to leave out Big Red Palmetto dot store. We'll be having a knob knowledge question that we'll be asking in just a few minutes. And it has something to do with Citadel Bulldog basketball. So, Get, uh, get your knob knowledge ready, and we'll have a lot of fun talking Bulldog basketball and, of course, Bulldog football as the Citadel football team gets ready to head north to the banks of the Hudson where they take on the Army Black Knights here this weekend. Let's bring on our Charleston Post and Courier beat writer real quick, Jeff Hartzell, and then we've got Coach Balcom waiting over here in the shadows. Jeff Hartzell, welcome back into Citadel Gray Line. Hey, great. Great to be here again, John, and good to see you again, Duger. Long time no see. And there's Duger right there, and again, the head coach of the of the Bulldog basketball team. At his position there at my, where's your office located in McAllister Fieldhouse? Uh, I'm on the second floor of McAllister. Like what, uh, what corner of the building? Uh, so if you're looking at the building, I would be on the second floor on the left. So if you came off the elevator, hung a left, and then um, a quick right, um, Right, right near my office is a wing with all my basketball coaches, and right next to Mike Capasio, my athletic director. I see. He's right you, up the hall. You're just a, a a chip shot away from first battalion. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. That's yeah, a uh, 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 a 58 degree wedge. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna talk basketball of you with you, of course, Coach Balcom. But we also have a lot of Bulldog football to talk about, and we welcome your questions or comments for Coach Balcom. You can put those on our Facebook feed, and that's at Citadel Gray Line. And, of course, you can also reach us at Citadel Gray Line with our telephone number, and that number is a local number in Charleston. It's 843-779-8496. And here's all three of us ready to talk about Bulldog sports and more. Jeff? Football, getting ready to take on West Point after a couple of days off. They didn't have a game last week. Your thoughts? What did you hear from Coach Thompson this week as we get ready to head north? Right. The Bulldogs uh, had last weekend off, and it sounded like they had a pretty heavy practice schedule. According to Brent Thompson, uh, he reeled off uh, about five days in a row that they had practiced and, of course, um, got a chance to sort of return to the fundamentals during your open week and work on some of the problems that have plagued them uh, during their 0-3 start. Hopefully they've got some of these penalty issues uh, ironed out because they will need to play very well when they go up to Army. Army's 3-1 and one so far this season. Their only loss was to a 14th ranked Cincinnati team. So uh, the final game of the season that we know of, <laughs> there's always a chance that Something could happen, but Mike Capaccio has said he, he doesn't think the Citadel will add uh, another game this fall, although he says he gets phone calls every day from people wanting to play. So, But they've got to keep the spring in mind, you know, in, in case the SOCON or when the SOCON comes out with a plan for spring football, you can't get overloaded in the fall if you expect to play again in the spring. So this will be the last game of the season for the Citadel and – their last chance to get a W in this uh, in this short fall season. Jeff Hartzell, the Post and Courier Citadel beat writer, and Duger Balcom, the unofficial beat writer of Citadel fans, <laughs> especially when it comes to Citadel football. So, Duger, if you don't mind, your thoughts on what's been going on with Brent Thompson's team here the last couple of months? Yeah, John, um, I'm excited the kids got to play. I think uh, General Walters and – and uh, I call him Coach Capacio. Mike, um, we're ahead of the curve and all that and, and getting our guys opportunities to play and um, thrilled for the coaching staff. They've been able to, um, you know, spend time with their guys. I mean, they recruit those guys to come here and play football and uh, certainly be a part of the core, but football is a huge part of their life. And I'm just glad they've gotten to compete in three games so far and 
uh, look forward to the Army game. Uh, we'll be tuned in at, I guess, one thirty on Saturday and uh, hoping they can pull off a win there. But, you know, they've had a pretty tough schedule playing uh, three three big time programs and um, and I was actually at the Eastern Kentucky game and and they were they were a very talented team, very very good at the skill positions for sure. A lot of speed, big receivers, and a great quarterback. So, um, you know, I'm I'm excited for them. I'm glad they got to play and and who knows what the spring holds. That's such an un, unknown right now. Yeah, Duger, their schedule is like if your team three out of every four games they were playing a. Uh... Uh, FBS squad or uh, a power five squad. That's a tough schedule. Yeah, yeah I think so. Year. Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I've, I've played in those games. I've, I've been beat by 70 at Butler. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've, um, you know, I've, I've been in a lot of those games, uh, you know, three a year basically that we play, but uh, certainly not 75% of my, my fall schedule, like, you know, Brent's had to, but I think it's awesome that he's going back to, uh, you know, his hometown. I thought you wrote a great article. I got to read it last night about him getting, you know, basically go back 30 miles from home. And uh, that's yeah. a beautiful stadium and a uh, great atmosphere. Uh, the, I'm sure their cadets will be there. And, and I'm sure Brent will have the guys ready to play, especially off a of bye week. Yeah, I, I, um, I expect them to play better, uh, cleaner football this week than they have so far this season. And that's really all you can ask for when you're playing a schedule like this is to play to your own standard, right? To play clean football, to execute, to have good effort. And the score will be what the score will be. But I think he's, his frustration so far stems from they haven't played to their own standard, he, just despite who the opponent is. Uh, maybe the exception of the second half against Clemson when they were facing the Tiger Reserves, they played pretty well uh, on both sides. But other than that, you know, they haven't really played to their own standard. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, uh, 11 players opted out, including most of the starting backfields and their All-America transfer from VMI. So when that percentage of your roster is not available, uh, it makes it tough when you're relying on very young players, as you know, <laughs> from last season. <laughs> Yeah, I lived through about three months of that last year. Um, unfortunately, it was all in the conference play. But, um, no, I think Brent, I mean, he holds his guys to an extremely high standard, whether it be on the field or on the court, in the core, uh, as does his coaching staff. And, you know, I, I watched the South Florida game uh, on TV. You know, the, the weather there, you know, I'm not a – Brent nor I are a guy to make a lot of excuses, but it was what it was, you know, uh, had kind of a fluky play with the punt. Um, I think weather had a little bit to do with that. Um, you know, first game, um, getting things fixed up. And then what people got to realize, I think the second half against the Citadel, uh, the, the Clemson reserves, the Clemson reserves could start on any team in the SOCON. Oh, uh, no question. The Clemson <laughs> reserves would win the SOCON championship. No, no question. And I thought they made progress there. Mm -hmm. And then they came back home and, um, you know, they're playing in a unique environment. Uh, I, I was actually one of the boxes. I, I was actually invited by an alumnus to um, spend time, Amber and I, to spend time with he and his wife, which was awesome. And I uh, got to watch it from a different view. I'm usually on about the 35-yard line down in my seats. And uh, it was just a, a whole different feel there, you know, with just part of the knob knobs there. Um, right not the noise, the atmosphere that Johnson Haygood normally has. Um, I don't know what kind of effect that had on the guys, but I can't imagine taking the field with my backfield. Uh, you know, when you're a run-oriented team and your backfield kind of just disappears on you. Um, and, and, and one was an All-American that, that you kind of had built the spring around and, and planned on him being there. Um, you know, I, I feel for Brent and his staff, I think, I'm, I'm sure they're more disappointed than anybody, but um, I look for a different team to come out uh, against Army. Uh, like yeah, you in your article, there's not going to be a whole lot of surprises. Those guys are very close friends and, and actually right. uh, share ideas and stuff. So with two weeks to prepare, I'm sure Brent will have them ready. Yeah, um, that's the heartbreak of the whole situation. The, the roster that they plan on having this fall to compete for a SOCON championship, that roster will never – play for a SOCON championship. Uh, the, the, the fall season was wiped out. They only had four games. And then 
some guys will have to move on before a spring season if there is a spring season. So the roster they had put together for this season, which uh, in my opinion was good enough to compete for the SoCon championship, that roster will not play football together. And that's really a sad, uh, sad thought when you think about it. But the kids who are on the team are getting to play this fall. And I think that's been good for their emotional and mental and physical well-being as they uh, as the school battles through this uh, pandemic era that we're in. And as mentioned, this weekend is a bit of a homecoming for head coach Brent Thompson of the Citadel football team as he grew up just a few minutes away from the West Point campus. And at his press conference earlier in this week, Coach Thompson was asked about that from beat writers like Jeff Hartzell of the Post and Courier. And let's hear what Coach Thompson said about going home this time as the head football coach of the mighty Citadel Bulldogs. Well, ever since we got hired here, and um, I've always uh, kind of given Coach Taft the credit that he deserved for everything that he has done here, everything that he had did, did here. Um, and, of course, he was the head coach for those two teams. Uh, coming from Army, I, thought, I know that those two uh, wins were very important for him. He, too, is a, uh, is a New York guy from the Albany area. So um, when I got here, I, I found out a lot about Coach Taft. I had known who he was, but found out about a lot about what he meant to the Citadel. Uh, and of course, uh, being a part of those uh, nine uh, FBS wins that he's got, he, he was a huge part of a lot of those wins. And um, so I, I think he's a uh, these those two wins that he had against uh, against the um, Army were, were two two big wins and two big wins for him for sure. Were you an Army football fan growing up? I was. Uh, yeah, so the uh, we only had one FBS team, and that was Army. And uh, I can remember now in the early 90s when Coach Taft was here, I was in high school at that time. Um, so I, we really didn't get a chance to come over and watch too many Army games. But uh, in the late 80s, when I was just before the high school, in uh, 84, 85, 86, um, we used to go to quite a bit of West Point games. And really up until about a few years ago, uh, my dad's two sisters, my aunts, had season tickets to Army. And that was head coach Brett Thompson earlier in the week at his press conference discussing how he as a youngster went to see the Black Knights play. And I've actually talked to him about this, and I'm not so sure that Brent Thompson wasn't a, a little lad there in the stands of Mikey Stadium in either 1991 or 1992 when a Charlie Taft coach Citadel Bulldog team went up to West Point and defeated the Black Knights, some dramatic wins back then. In fact, if, uh, if Coach Balcom, I'm sure your basketball team has been perfect cadets at their time at the Citadel I was a perfect cadet until the Atlanta Braves got into the 1992 World Series. And <laughs> while serving as an officer of the guard there, right, right out the door there at 1st Battalion, the only times I had to walk the quad and do tours as a cadet was my senior year when I got caught, instead of wearing my nice guard uniform like you're supposed to, I put on a Braves cap to cheer on the Braves <laughs> late, late one Saturday night after a Citadel victory on the football field. And I got caught wearing my Braves cap. And so I had to walk the quad. And I specifically remember walking tours during the Citadel Army game of 1992. And that was like the only time you could listen to a radio while you had to do your back and forth on the quad. And that was a really fun experience listening to Citadel defeat the West Point Black Knights there, even if I had to tote a gun for 55 minutes or whatever the link was. Hey, well, I think uh, wearing the Braves hat was actually probably worth it uh, in the long run. <laughs> I think uh, I jinxed them because they didn't win that year. Well, actually, it's crazy. I went to game four, four game, yes, game four of that series uh, of the the first year the Braves ran it when they played the Twins. And um, if you'll remember, that was the game that uh, there was a sacrifice fly in the ninth inning, and then they won two to one. And then the next Thursday night, they destroyed Minnesota, and they went to Minnesota and lost two. So um, kind of crazy. But, um, uh, yeah, I was at that game. And, and uh, while you were walking the quad for an hour, people, <laughs> stayed in the, people stayed in the stands and actually did the chop, the Tommy Hawk chop for an hour. So uh, uh, I thought you were going to tell me there at, at, at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, I thought you were going to tell me they were sitting around listening to the Citadel defeat Army. Is that is that what you're going to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can't say that, but uh, 
I got to I got to give a, a shout out. It, we'll, we'll fast forward since we're making connections between the Braves and and the Citadel. First of all, of course, the Turner connection, sending his sons to the Citadel for a few years there. But I was at the 1999 World Series when the Braves played the Yankees, and it was the first game in Atlanta of that series. And it was a, a Citadel honor guard brought out the colors to, for the national anthem. So that was a really neat thing to see. So for all of you who had been cadets there in the late 90s or 2000, that was a great thing to see the Citadel there at the World Series. Okay, that's baseball. We still got to talk football and basketball. <laughs> well, um, you know, those two wins over Army are obviously a huge part of Citadel football history and Citadel football lore. Uh, they haven't played Army since 1994, and that game was a 25-24 Army victory on a last-second field goal. So, um, you know, uh, I think it's good that this series is resumed, even though it took a coronavirus pandemic to make it happen. And maybe they'll find a way to mix in the service academies a little more often uh, going forward. But I was able to talk yesterday to uh, a a young man, uh, he's not so young anymore, Jeff Trin, who kicked the winning field goal against Army in 1992. And Jeff is a great story. His family fled Viet war-torn Vietnam in the, the late 70s when he was about six or seven years old, took a boat to a refugee camp in Malaysia, and then immigrated to the U.S. He went to Stahl High School here in Charleston and ended up kicking that winning field goal against uh, Army in 1992. Now he lives in Kernersville, North Carolina, raising his family, and his son kicks for his high school team. Wow. So really a great story uh, about uh, one of the heroes from uh, that 1992 victory. That'll be in the Post and Courier uh, this afternoon and in print on Thursday. And, Jeff, I'm sure you know this, and, of course, I'm sure Coach Balcom knows this as well, but – we have a unique twist to those Citadel Army games of the early 1990s, and that unique twist is a recent addition to the athletic staff there at the Citadel. Gaylord Green has a position there, fundraising, and he was a receiver for the Army Black Knights back in those early 90s, and he lost two times to the <laughs> Citadel Bulldogs. So if you need a other perspective, Jeff, and any of your writing leading up to this game, Gaylord Green, double G there, a retired officer in the military working there with Duger Balcom and more. I meant to call Gaylord this week, and it's only Wednesday, so I still have time. Yeah. So I will do that a... and rub it in, rub it in that he lost twice to the Citadel. Uh, Coach Balcom, have you and Gaylord worked together yet? We have. He's, he's one of my favorites, uh, in May, uh, I get to spend a lot of time. This this May, uh, not so much because of the virus, but uh, the previous four years, I've got to go out in May and go to different Citadel clubs all over the, the southeast and do it with Coach Thompson. And uh, last year, Gaylord participated in those, and they were a lot fun with him on uh, a lot more fun with him on board. And uh, Brent and I enjoyed his West Point stories, and uh, he's great for our department. I mean, he's he's great at his job at fundraising and. You won't find a better guy. I mean, he's an absolutely awesome person and uh, just a fun guy to be around. Jeff, what is the key to victory here against West Point this week? Well, uh, they got to find a way to play cleaner football. Uh, fewer penalties, way fewer turnovers. They've got to maintain possession against that Army option, which is the same thing Army wants to do against the Citadel. So, it might be a game where each team only has the ball uh, five or six times. You know, uh, you never know how that's going to turn out. But Army's defense is very good this year. Um, they're one of the top in the nation against the rush. Their defensive coordinator is Nate Woody, who coached for years and years at Wofford. So he's very familiar with the Citadel and what the Citadel is trying to do on offense. So it's going to be a tough task uh, as far as that goes. Uh, Army played a backup quarterback last week, Jamel Jones. He's a sophomore, and I expect he'll be the starter again this week. He ran for over 100 yards and two touchdowns against Abilene Christian. So uh, that's who uh, the Citadel can look for at uh, quarterback, and they have a freshman slot back who had a big game against Abilene Christian as well. So it's going to be a tough task uh, going up there to Army. I think Army's about a 30-point favorite. 
But the, the main thing for uh, for the Citadel is to play their own game, play to their own standard, and uh, I think they can come out of there feeling pretty good, no matter what the score is, if they can do that. Jeff, have you been given, given any indication that some of the Citadel football players, this will be their final time suiting up in blue and white this week? No official indication, but I certainly expect that to be the case. You know, guys like Brandon Rainey and Raleigh Webb, they're fifth-year seniors. They get their master's degrees in December. Are they going to devote another eight months of their lives to football when they might have jobs waiting, uh, things like that? Raleigh Webb, you know, might be looking at uh, opportunities to play at the next level. He certainly got that physical ability to do that. And then you have a guy like Willie Eubanks, who uh, uh, also has opportunities at the next level. So will, would he come back in the spring or would he move on and go to an NFL tryout camp or, or something like that? So this certainly could be the last game for uh, several Citadel seniors. And uh, that's part of the, uh, the, the heartache of this season is when you think about what could have been for these guys if they could have competed with their full roster for a uh, SOCON championship. That's why guys like Brandon Rainey and Raleigh Webb came back for their fifth years for that opportunity. So we're glad that they got to play football this fall. A little sad that it wasn't quite the season that uh, they should have had. All right, 1.30 Eastern time. It's the Citadel and the Black Knights of Army, and you can catch this on the CBS Sports Network. Citadel Bulldog football one more time here in 2020. And perhaps we'll have some spring football headed our way, and the Citadel will have at least several SOCON games they can suit up for and play and perhaps win a conference championship. We're going to move over and talk basketball, but let me first tell you about IPS Packaging and Automation. It's a name you can trust. They've been in business since way back in 1976. IPS Packaging and Automation has been providing manufacturers and the e-commerce companies with the very best packaging and products in the industry. IPS offers a complete line of stretch films and 3M tapes to corrugated boxes, strapping, and automation. IPS packaging and automation with, will analyze and streamline your current methods to improve your packaging process. Very simple. Give them a call at 800-277-7007 to learn more. Visit them on the web at ipac.com. That's I-P-A-C-K.com. IPS Packaging and Automation, a proud supporter of Citadel Athletics. We've got a knob knowledge trivia question we're going to ask as well right here. And this one might take a little bit extra brain power. It won't for Duger Balcom, but the question this week is Citadel Bulldog basketball related. And we have this trivia question that's presented in part by BigRedPalmetto.store. And give them a look with over 300 products on the store that you can go check out right now. And the Knob Knowledge trivia question, you're going to have to do a lot of typing on your phone here if, if you want to get this one right. So we're going to go with score since Duger Balcom's known to have a high-octane offense on the basketball court I want to know three of the top five leading scorers in Citadel basketball history. All you got to do is give me three of the five, and the first person that can text us here at 843-779-8496 that can list three of the five top scorers in Citadel basketball history will get a $25 gift certificate to BigRedPalmetto.store. Sure, you can go online and Google it off of CitadelSports.com. Don't do that. I, I bet you you know the answer. You can at least give me three of the top five scores in the history of the program, and we'll get you that nice gift certificate to BigRedPalmetto.store. Text that response right now. The first person that gives me three of the five, they win the $25. All you got to do is, again, text us at 843 779 84 96. Now that ought to be pretty fun because I know Coach Balcom, one of those guys that's in that list, you had a, a privilege of coaching, and I wouldn't want to have to text his name out there. And I don't want to give his name away, but uh, yeah, his name is not the easiest to text. No, it's not. Uh, but what a great player he was. And if, if you look in the top, he, he would be in the top three of scoring, rebounding, and block shots. So Maybe that'll give somebody a hint, but a great yeah. player. 
I wish he, I was not, he was not the leader. We've had some good scoring no, no. players in the history of Bulldog basketball. and uh, I, I think I know three of them. I'm sure you do, Jeff. I, if you, if I you won't don't know, say it. Yeah, you won't say it. But, uh, yeah, text us that answer, and we'll get you set up there, courtesy of BigRedPalmetto.store. Coach Balcom, we're talking to you for the first time since your season shut down at the end of the last year. And I'm sorry y'all didn't make it to the big dance along with the rest of college basketball. That's, that is one thing you share with everybody else that played basketball last year. Yeah. it. Um, you know, what's crazy is we were one of the few tournaments that actually, uh, you know, everybody got to participate in. And we actually crowned a champion in East Tennessee State who won 30 games. And, um, you know, disappointed for those guys. Uh of, of all the teams, with the exception maybe of the Wofford team before and a Davidson team back in 95, uh, I think I thought that East Tennessee State actually had a chance to go in and win a game and uh, as Wofford did the year before and really helped the SOCON. But uh, that was taken away from a lot of people. And, um, it, you know, it was just unfortunate, but, you know, just, just, just kind of what happened. And uh, we've had to kind of move on from it. Coach, how would you sum up what happened last year? You didn't win a single SOCON game. Um, easy, the longest year of my life, <laughs> uh, uh, and I've had I've had a bunch of years um, uh, more than anybody on this call. Um, but no, uh, it was you know what, John? It's it's crazy, and this is crazy for somebody to say that uh, when Owen eighteen in the SOCON. Um, it was a, a joyous team to coach. I mean, we were depleted um, with injuries and um, starting sometimes our 12th and 13th scholarship player, um, sometimes dressing seven scholarship players, sometimes dressing eight. Uh, but of all that, in three months of going through that, we never had a bad practice, um, which is not many coaches can say that. Uh, I've been on a lot of winning teams and can't say that, but um, – Tyson Baptiste, our grad transfer, who came to us from Central Connecticut State, he just would not allow that. Um, Derek Webster, a high-energy guy. Uh, Fletcher A.B., who was all freshman team. Those guys just were not going to have bad practices. Every game we went into, those guys thought they had a chance to win. And, um, and, and we usually did play well. Jeff was at a lot of them. We usually did play well for at least a half or three-quarters of the game and, and just didn't have enough uh, tools in the toolbox to get it done. But um, it was a long season, uh, a learning uh, season for everyone. But um, to say we've had some competitive practices of late would be an understatement because nobody ever wants to go through that again. Duger, um, was it just a string of bad luck or have you gone back and tried to see if there was any connection between everything that happened and change training or anything like that? Or was it just a string of bad luck? Jeff, Jeff, we had more injuries last year. I think uh, nothing to do with, I think, I mean, we've been playing this way for, I guess, uh, 15 years now, uh, going on the 15th year. Uh, we accumulated more injuries last year than I have in all my 18 years as a head coach uh, combined. I mean, like, never had the significant season-ending injuries like we had. Uh, everything from hamstrings to – to uh, stress reactions in the femur, to knee injuries. Um, I mean, it was just a multitude of things. Uh, uh, a hip labrum, which I didn't even know there was such a thing, uh, you know, depleted Connor Kern uh, last summer. So, I mean, we lost him. He would have been a starter, um, a veteran starter, a fifth year, you know, actually a six year guy um, that would have really helped us. Uh, what he did at the end of the season before was was what he was capable of doing, and he never really got a chance to show that. And Hayden Brown was playing at a, a crazy high level when he got hurt. Uh, he had 26-9 and nine at Georgia against probably he'll be the number one draft pick uh, coming up in the draft. Um, just an outstanding game there and was playing at a high level, and we lose him the next game. So um, just kind of crazy that it all happened in one year. But – it did, and uh, luckily all those guys are back, with the exception of Connor. He had to move on, um, but he was out of eligibility. But the other guys are healthy. We've had great practices, and uh, getting Jackson, who was one of our most promising freshmen coming in, getting him back at full speed has certainly certainly been a blessing. 
And we're looking at some highlights of that Georgia game last year. That was really, what the, in some ways, the best game you played all year. That was a close game. Yeah, we were we were semi healthy at that in that game. Uh, pretty much, um, it was actually the last game Jackson Gammons played. Um, it was next to the last game that Hayden played. Um, like I say, we didn't have Connor. Jerry Higgins played in that game, um, and then you know, kind of everything. Everything went kind of uh, askew after that, but um, we played well. I mean, at um, last media timeout, we were down three points, so um, we had to, you know, make Tom Crean call a timeout to get his group reorganized. But those last three minutes, I mean, nine points wasn't indicative of how close that game actually was um, throughout. Uh, the guys really, really played well. We out rebounded Georgia by I think nine, um, and they were a very athletic um, Southeastern Conference team. So. I uh, was proud of my guys for that effort. I just wish we'd had uh, more of those guys, you know, kind of down the stretch. Yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm going back here. I haven't even cheated and looked at the website for a reminder, Coach, but you had a close game there at UGA. Then you went on the road all the way to Cape Girardeau in Missouri, and you beat SEMO there, and that was a good win. Then you went and played – Illinois, that was a tough loss to a Big Ten team. And then you went and beat the Red Foxes of Marist. Did, did I get all that right? You did. You, you've done your homework. That's that's uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that was the uh, – uh, I'll just say the road trip from Hades, uh, especially <laughs> especially from a, 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 my operations guy's standpoint. We actually flew into Cape Girardeau uh, on a Monday, played SEMO Tuesday night. Hayden got hurt in that game, but we went on to win. Uh, we bust actually from there to Champaign, Illinois, played Illinois the next day. And that was a scheduling kind of snafu. They needed to move the game. Um, so we, we played back to back, which is pretty uncommon on the road, especially at two different destinations. Um, and then we, uh, we were down 14 at that, at the half. Then we bus to Chicago, fly to Albany, bus from Albany to Poughkeepsie play at Marist on Saturday night. We win there uh, without Hayden, uh, without Jackson. And uh, then that was a great, great win for us. And then we uh, flew home. We bust uh, from Poughkeepsie to Newark and fly home. I mean, it was <laughs> it was a crazy trip. But hey, any road trip you go, go two for three uh, is a great road trip. Um, two, two trips to get milkshakes on that on that road trip. So that was that was awesome. Yeah, speaking of those milkshakes, your team known for the victory milkshake. Does that include you? Do you get the milkshake too? I don't drink. Yeah, I don't drink milkshakes. Uh, I get sweet tea. So um, uh, my we have. It's funny we have an uh, an order list. So the guys they don't get to to deviate much from what they pick at the beginning of the year. Now we might make one you know change during the year but if say if jeff likes uh chocolate chip milkshakes that's what he's getting after victories you know on the road and if, if you like strawberry you're getting strawberry and and my my drink of choice is sweet tea so uh it was it was kind of funny uh we won at cape gerardo we have to bus to uh bus to champagne which was a three-hour bus ride and we got on the bus and i told the bus driver he said we're looking at about three hours i said well first of all we need to find some milkshakes and he looked at me like I had four heads. Uh, he didn't know our tradition at that point, but um, he was filled in pretty quickly. Uh, so we found a Sonic and we're able to get our milkshakes and, and move on. Coach, yeah, it takes it. a while to make 18 milkshakes. <laughs> uh, hey, I got smarter assistants than me. They call in, call in ahead. So uh, <laughs> they're usually ready for us when we get there. And uh, Cookout's deal. a great spot and Sonic's a great spot. Um, but – yeah, we can usually find a place, and we certainly know in conference where that where they actually are on conference games. So if we went on the road there, we'd drive straight to it. Well, update us on a, the health of some guys who who struggled with injury last year. How's Hayden Brown doing? He had that hamstring that cost him uh, almost the entire year. Yeah, and luckily he got that year back. Um, so eligibility wise, he's a junior, and uh, even though he's a senior in the core, a captain um, in the core of cadets, and um, will actually graduate in December uh, and then take some graduate classes. So he's, he's, he's certainly done his work in the classroom. But he, um, he is completely healthy, uh, knock on wood. You know, he plays so hard uh, that sometimes he uh, hits the floor pretty hard and, you know, it kind of gasps when he does. But 
um, wouldn't change that competitive nature in him for anything. He he uh, fights and competes every day. So he's back healthy. We got Jackson Gammons back healthy from his stress reaction. Um, the great thing about that is is that was discovered. Um, uh, that could have been catastrophic had he broken, you know, the largest bone in your body. Had that actually fractured, uh, that could have been, you know, uh, a, a lot more bad things could have happened than ending your basketball career had that happened. So, um, you know, as bad as he hated it, he was able to get that year back. And nobody works harder uh, on his own than Jackson Gammons. So did we had need, him. Did he need surgery or – no, it was it was just a deal of uh, the bone had to heal. Um, you know, if he if he'd have kept stressing on it, and he had played through it. He, you know, we just noticed. Uh, Coach Bell actually noticed. You know, he said, "Coach, he's not running like the kid we recruited. He's not, you know, he's not lifting like the kid we recruited." And um, and we started watching him on film, and and, and Willie was exactly right. Um, mm-hmm. We got it an X-rayed, and the X-ray wasn't conclusive. Then we got an MRI. And, it was just something that needed rest and the bone needed to heal. Wow. And yeah. So Short uh, five for coach bell there. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know he, he had a, you know, he could possibly be a physician one day, but, um, but he, he, he certainly noticed it. Uh, we, we noticed it in his play. Um, you know, I have a lot of other things going on. I'm watching all 13 of them, but, but he really picked up on that and, um, a, a wise move and, and we got our medical staff on it and, um, He's healed completely, and and um, we just try to keep him healthy. And then Brady Spence really showed some flashes as a six nine freshman, and then he had a knee injury late in the year. How is Brady? Brady's great. Um, you know what? Brady doesn't get credit for. You know, we talk about all the other injuries, but uh, Brady, if he'd have been healthy the whole year, he'd have been all freshman team. I mean, he played. You know, you you, you saw him play against um, James Dickey, the best defensive player in the in the SOCON right there, they're showing highlights. I mean, he had uh, 17, I think, and 11 maybe against James Dickey. So um, played really, really well against him and, and was doing it on one leg. So we had to, we, he was supposed to have surgery in March, but because of COVID, we had to move it back until I think it ended up being late April. So we've just now gotten him back and he's gone about three training sessions full speed. Um, and so he, I would say he's probably at about 85% right now. Um, but 85% Brady's better than what we were finishing with last year. Um, yeah. so, and did, so he's going to help us. Fletcher AB did make all freshmen and was able to make it through the whole season, right? What do you expect from Fletcher in his second yeah. season? Yeah, Fletcher's been awesome in, um, in workouts and has come back a better player. He's added a little more dimension to his game. He's getting to the rim more and finishing at the rim. But, you know, Everybody talks about our injuries. What nobody talks about is Fletcher played banged up and with a lot of knee soreness and stuff the entire year, as did Tyson Baptiste, and they never missed a practice, never missed a game, uh, but just played hurt kind of all year because uh, the minutes they were playing. But um, Fletcher uh, is, a, is, a, is a student of the game. He wants to be a coach, um, a fun kid to coach, uh, great person to be around, 4.0 student. Uh, can't ask for much better uh, than Fletcher. And then uh, Caden Rice is also back for his senior year. What are you looking for from Caden? Yeah, just just basically with Caden. I mean, you 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 see most all of our games. It's it's just a little more consistency right. from him. You know, Caden uh, um, shoots a high percentage from three, and if I could ever get him to take you know the right shots and not not take some shots that are are difficult makes. I mean, he could shoot over 40%. And and at his height, at 6'7", and if he shoots over 40% his season, senior year, he'll have a chance to play elsewhere. And that's his goal, and that's what we worked with him at. Uh, we've really done some really competitive shooting drills, and he and Fletcher really go at each other's throat in those shooting drills, and it's actually fun to watch. One will, one will break the other one's record, but um, as good of kids as they are, they cheer for one another. And then as soon as they can take the court, they try to break, break the other one's record. So – um, we're expecting a big year out of Caden. Uh, and then uh, talk about your new guys. Uh, you got a grad transfer, Tyler Moff. Is yeah. That how, Ty- how you say his name? Yeah, Tyler Moff. Um, and three freshmen to, coming in. Yeah. So Tyler, um, you know, has played three and a half, three years and seven games of college basketball. Um, an experienced kid. 
uh, a workaholic, um, a guy who's very blue collar in his approach to the game and um, a very appreciative kid. Uh, you know, he played at a D2 school. So now he's at division one level and he'll certainly contribute for us. He can shoot from three. He can, he's one of the guys we allow to shoot mid range shots because that's kind of his forte. Um, he distributes the ball. Well, really hard nosed defender and uh, a terrific kid to be around. He is, he has fit in our locker room um, just very, very well because he understands what all our other kids are going through on a daily basis. This is the Citadel Gray Line. Our guest is Duger Balcom, head coach of the Citadel Bulldog basketball team. And want to let you know that if you want a chance to win a $25 gift certificate courtesy of BigRedPalmetto.store, we're getting a lot of guesses in, and some of these guesses are correct, but i got to give a shout to whoever has the last four digits of 2186, I think it is, you got two of the three names right, but the third one is not correct, so keep on guessing if you want to get this $25 gift certificate. The trivia question, by the way, it's our knob knowledge question, and it is this week. Name the top five scores in Citadel basketball history. I don't need all five. I just need you to give us three of the top five scores in the history of the program, and if you correctly give us three of the five, you'll win a $25 gift certificate courtesy of BigRedPalmetto.store. We had Richard on last week, and he is ready, willing, and able to ship you out whatever you choose there with your $25 gift certificate or more as he's got all kinds of great Citadel stuff there, officially licensed Citadel stuff that he can get to you. So, again, 843 779 84 96 Duger Balcom is our special guest and Coach Balcom, you look kind of naked sitting there without a Citadel branded item there. We need to get the Big Red Palmetto store to get you something there today. <laughs> hey, I usually wear something Citadel. I actually have on some Citadel, uh, my oh, Citadel there you shirt go. here, but yeah, but. Uh, I knew I was on the uh, gray line, so I wore gray. In yeah, the I like that. I, do you mind if I pick on you for just a second? Is no, that okay? please do. Can, can I haze you for just a second? Please. I, I can't say that I watched every moment of every Bulldog basketball game last year, and, and this may even go back to the year before, but at the Citadel, we kind of make a big deal out of uniforms and such, and – and uh, I'm going to pick on you because I think you're the only college basketball coach that I've seen not wear a coat and tie on the court. Now, some coaches take a couple of games off where they wear what you've been wearing. Is there something going on that – and, and, and if, if you know, maybe this is good luck for you, but what's your decision? Because your assistants often do wear coats and ties. Yeah. Uh, so, actually, uh, you're not hazing me. Uh I'm actually a trendsetter. If uh, you're okay. watching the NBA bubble right now, uh, all those coaches are wearing pullovers and uh, slacks or are kind of what, what I wear on a daily basis, uh, on a gamely basis. And uh, I just found out the other day in a tweet from Steve Forbes that the ACC coaches have all agreed to do that this coming year. Um, so I was, I'm, I'm probably just ahead of the curve on all that, uh, <laughs> to be honest. But uh no, to me, um, we, we, we uh, coaches do it uh, when they go to holiday tournaments. Uh, you know, in Maui, they'll wear the Hawaiian shirts. And uh, when they come to the Charleston Classic, guys will wear, you know, the more casual uh, thing. I, I'm kind of animated at times. I feel claustrophobic in a, a tie. Um, and so we did it on the road. We, we used to just do it on the road, but it was uh, just very, very comfortable for me. And um, – I kind of did it. I think I probably can name the coaches. I think the guy, uh, Jeremy Ballard at Florida International wears a polo. Um, Musselman at Arkansas wears a polo. Um, and then every now and then, um, Keith Dambrot at uh, Duquesne does also. So it's crazy. I know those things, but I pick up on things when I watch TV. Yeah. But last night, Spolstra and, uh, and the Lakers coach. They uh, they had it on in the championship. So, well, well yeah. to your credit, you haven't adopted the former Mercer basketball coach's strategy of wearing all black. <laughs> no, nah, I'm not sure I can go there, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Can I, so, can I just say that the Citadel's Adidas gear is sharp? I mean, it looks good. So, yeah, Adidas, uh, yeah, Adidas. If you're listening or watching, 
Uh, Jeff, go ahead and share your home address there so they can load you up. <laughs> You know, you know, y'all, y'all mentioned that. You know, we're kind of in a um, a little bit of a quandary this year. Um, Adidas didn't ma- hadn't manufactured stuff. You know, this this year uh, we're just now getting our practice gear in. Uh, it's the first time since I've been here we haven't gotten new uniforms. Um, we're going with the uniforms that we had just because of production thing through Adidas. So we haven't been sent pullovers this year. So I don't know. You know, this year will kind of be a surprise what we wear. It's kind of crazy. The ACC is going to the more comfortable look, and um, it'll be interesting for Adidas schools uh, because it's just, you know, the virus has done so many things to so many people, and it it certainly has done the same to uh, our equipment manufacturer. Are you saying the ACC is going to go with the circa 1987-88 NC State track type uniform? Do you remember those? <laughs> yeah, they, they were actually called a unitard. Yeah, I Unitard. Think. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey, while, while we're yeah. talking about important subjects like this, Coach Balcom, there has been something not quite uniform related, but something has happened inside McAllister Fieldhouse these last few months. Give us an idea what fans can expect when and if we can get in there and see you play. Yeah, we got a whole new set of uh, bleachers. Um, thanks to my athletic director and our fundraising um, people led by Gaylord and in his in his staff and Russell Frierson, who's the uh, the head of the Brigadier Foundation, uh, they're really really nice. Uh, if uh, anybody gets to experience it this year, which I think we will have limited crowd um, capacity, but they're extremely nice. I don't know when those seats were put in, Jeff, the last ones, but um, it probably ranks right there with my lifetime, probably. <laughs> uh, they were in need long, of re- they were in need of repair. No question. Oh, some of them would actually throw you out of the seat, but but I've been blessed. Since I've been here, we've gotten a new floor. We got to design the floor like we wanted, and then uh, Mike has come through and gotten us new seats on the on the home side. So I think our fans will really really like it. It's certainly comfortable. All right, uh, let's go ahead. And if we, if you don't mind, we're we're getting our questions, the the knob knowledge. We're just going to have to go ahead and award our winner this week to an underachiever because this person did not get three <laughs> correct guesses. They got two. So we're going to go ahead as part of our knob knowledge presented by big red store. Cause I'm sure coach Balcom wants to maybe talk a little bit about some of these great Citadel basketball, basketball players of your. So here are your top five scores and bulldog basketball. Wait, oh, history. Hold on a second. Yeah. Can hold Jeff and I guess? Oh, y'all I, don't I know. Well, I'm going to give you my three that I think I know. Cameron okay. Wells. Cameron Reagan, Wells is number one. He had Reagan over Truesdale two. Yeah, he's two. And Zane Najdawi. You got it one, two, and three, Jeff. I think you know what yeah. you're doing. Okay, Coach, I'm going to leave it up to you. Who are the other two? Who's four and five? Uh, that I don't know, and I'm ashamed that I don't know because I have it on my wall outside my office, and I pass it every day, the top ten. I knew the top three. Uh, and I knew him in that order, but uh, I couldn't tell you who was four and five. Shame, shame, shame. <laughs> if your team will take you out there to, what do y'all call that, Camp Bulldog prior to the season? Yeah, Operation Findaway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah. Uh, they need yeah. to do a little uh, uh, Sullivan's Island extra running for you, the coach, because the the two, and this is going back a few years, Going back to the late 50s, the Blitz kids and Art Musselman, he is number four on this list as he played there in the late 1950s Citadel Bulldog basketball. And then the other one is Rick Swing out of Birmingham, Alabama, and he's on that list of the top five scorers. Again, recapping it, Rick Swing, Art Musselman, Zane Najdawi, Regan Truesdale, and then Cameron Wells. And we got to give the winner of this to the person with the, the phone that ends in 2186. So if you don't mind texting us back who you are, where you're located real quick, you're going to go ahead and get this $25 gift certificate from, from Big Red Palmetto Store. This, uh, this caller correctly guessed two of the three. They predict they guessed that Regan Truesdale and Art Musselman were on, were on the list of the top five scorers of Bulldog history. They failed on guessing this name, Zach Urbanus. Zach Urbanus, a great Bulldog basketball player, but not one of the top five scorers, it, it's as far as I can tell. Maybe it's all – with the way Duger Balkum's offense plays, 
they might be rewriting this history oh. book and record book any any second now. Zach Urbanus would have loved Duger's offense. He was uh, a great three point shooter coach. And uh, yeah, I know Zach, and uh, actually recruited Zach a little bit. I had two of his teammates at, for me at VMI from his AAU team. Mm -hmm. But Zach, before Zane displaced him, Zach was literally number ten on the all time scoring list, and Zane actually replaced him uh, just this year. And I had to text Zach and uh, tell him that. Uh, of course, uh, Cameron Wells played for Ed Conroy on the the twenty win team that Ed had, and is still playing pro ball in Europe. Is Zane Najdawi pursuing any pro ball at this point? Yes. So he played on the Jordanian national team two years ago. Mm -hmm. He came back to Charleston, um, was here in Charleston, and now he has gone back and is uh, playing uh, right now. Uh, I couldn't tell you what team he has signed with. I don't think they've actually started yet. But uh, he has signed a contract to go back to the Middle East and play. Um, he has dual citizenship because his dad is a Jordanian uh, native. And uh, he's back over there playing, as is Lou Stallworth. Um, Lou's actually in Romania uh, playing right now. And, and Cameron's playing still also. But Zach and Cameron were teammates. They, that, they had some really good players on that team. Oh, that was a great team with Demetrius Nelson from right here at Johns Island, South Carolina. And uh, yeah, th those guys were fun to watch. Cam could get to the rim against anybody. And he unfurled those long arms and laid it off the backboard. Uh, he was fun to watch. Coach Balcom, yeah. how much support do you get from the Citadel basketball alumni? Uh, a lot. Uh, our CBA is amazing, our Citadel Basketball Association. Um, it's made up of mostly older alumni, but uh, a lot of them are former players and not just basketball players. Some of them were football players and um, they're, they're, they're hugely supportive. Uh, they have a social before all our home games and um, can't thank those, those people enough. Um, and, and some of the younger players come back. Uh, Zach's been back. Um, we've had players in and out of the gym uh, before. And the ones I get to meet uh, are awful, you know, nice to come up and speak, but uh you know, and now, you know, you've been here a while if you've had players move on and are playing professionally. Matt Frierson, Jeff, is uh, – Matt Frierson, interesting. He signed a contract in Brazil, and he has been in Brazil since he signed the contract. So he has been there since, uh, like, February of last year. He's never come home back to Maryland. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so, so uh, he's living in a beautiful place, and as long as Matt has a gym and a ball and a gun – uh, to rebound for him, <laughs> he's happy, but uh, he's really, really doing well and has signed an extension with that team. So, so they'll play this year, and and he and he's playing with them. So, so very proud of Matt. Also, good for him. Yeah. Well, coach, I I have another question. Just looking at your roster here, who's going to start a point guard? Uh, that uh, that's been really a battle uh, of late between Rudy Fitzgibbons and uh, Tyler Moff. Uh, Tyler's been a point guard, um, you know, for three years at the collegiate level. And, and Rudy really came on strong for us last year. And, you know, as the last thing we did as a basketball team is, is we lost at Wofford. Uh, but Amber and I were in the emergency room with Rudy uh, fixing his displaced, disjointed finger that mm -hmm. occurred in that game. Only, only his last season would have, you know, he gets hurt in the last 10 minutes of the game. So we were in the um, – um, uh, room with him as they actually uh, gave him some medicine, got his finger back in place, and then he went home to Atlanta. Uh, he had a tragedy, had a friend die, and he actually did the eulogy for his friend. And John, you'll appreciate this. Uh, this is kind of Citadel lore now, but um, uh, the, the powers that be here were very, very wise last year, and they moved up recognition day to right before spring break. It was supposed to be the week after spring break. But the powers that be uh, actually sprung it on the kids, and nobody knew until the Thursday before the Friday that it happened, which was the Friday before spring break. Rudy was at home on a bereavement leave with his dislocated finger uh, mm -hmm. with his funeral coming up, and he drove back through the night. That, that event, Recognition Day, started at 4 a.m., and Rudy drove back through the night from Atlanta back to do that with his teammates. Uh, no splint on his finger, no anything, and went through every evolution that the gauntlet had for him that day. 
to be recognized with his teammates and his classmates. So uh, pretty impressive that a guy would do that. It was impressive. You mentioned that during your teleconference you had over the summer that the CitadelSports.com put on. And you also mentioned in that teleconference that we want to brag. Of course, it's great to get wins. And we had a rough time getting wins on the court last year. But, Coach, off the court, you did a heck of a job leading this program. And if you don't mind, brag on the academic success of Fitzgibbons as well as his fellow knobs of last year and how well your team's doing there in the classroom. Yeah, my knobs are fantastic. Uh, my five scholarship knobs, um, three four point oh's and the other two over three twos, three point twos. So uh, to come in, you know how it was as a knob at the Citadel. You got so many things thrown at you. Uh, your mind's going all different places. You're a Division One athlete, and then you take care of business in the classroom. You know, it's 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 a very uh, big chore. This year, I'm proud. We have 13 scholarship athletes, and I have six that have rank uh, within the core over in 1st Battalion now, too. So extremely proud of that. Uh, what they do off the court is um, e every bit as important as what they do on the court because it prepares them for life, and uh, it gets them ready for that. So uh, couldn't be more pleased with the guys, and I think this year is actually going to translate into some more wins on the court. We sure hope so because we're ready ready for that. And that leads me to the question, Coach. I know this is a little bit over your pay grade, not only on the Citadel campus, but really it goes, I guess, to Indianapolis. What is the latest grade with what we're going to have, if anything, for a college basketball season? Yeah, so right now our marching orders are um, the season can start on May 25th. Excuse me, May 25th, November 25th. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it might be May 25th, but November 25th is the actual start date. They have limited our games from 29 down to 25. Uh, the conference season will not take place until after Christmas. Our first slated game is against UNCG um, at the end of December, I think December 28th. Uh, that is subject to change. Also, they're talking about maybe playing three games in a week. That's a ever-flowing process. Um, we meet every week as a – coaching head coaches every week on a Zoom call every Thursday. So hopefully we'll get more direction tomorrow. Uh, so that will leave us with seven uh, non-conference games. And, the, and crazy as it sounds here in October, we're still placing those games together and getting dates because everyone's schedule pretty much blew up once they eliminated two weeks of the season. And it looks like uh, the games at Illinois and Duke and College of Charleston will not happen. Does that sound right, Coach? That is accurate. Um, now, all those guys have agreed to play us again next year uh, that we're excited about. So those three games should be in place. We just have to pick the dates that, um, you know, that we can all come together on. Uh, but they have all agreed. They're all contractually, um, you know, bound to do that. But they were nice enough to, to say, yes, we'll play next year. We'll just keep it in place. Hopefully we'll open up at Illinois again. But uh, those games went away. Uh, some of our contracted games, North Carolina A&T at home, Presbyterian at home, Longwood away, all those games are still scheduled. Um, but we're still, as we speak, Coach Castleberry is working hard on on um, putting together our schedule. And the College of Charleston was one of those games that we were excited to see back on the schedule. That's been postponed. Uh, is it too big of a distance to travel? For, for I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not saying for your sake, but what, what, how could you not play a, a team in your own city? And I know you didn't make this call, I don't think. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, it's it's. there's a lot of dynamics that go into that. Coach uh, Grant and I are really good friends and uh, good buddies, and it just hadn't worked out. Our, our first two years, we did play each other. They played here our first year. It was a close game. We lost, and then we opened up at their place the next year, and then we both just kind of had different agendas in scheduling, and we were able to put it back together this year. And uh, – it just hasn't worked out. He and I have been in communication uh, as well as J.D. Powell, his scheduling coach, to to try to get a advantageous date for both of us next year and um, hopefully maybe even opening weekend. We've discussed that. So uh, I, think it, I think it will be renewed and, um, and look forward to it when it is. We're ready for that one. That was always a, a hot contest between the Citadel and the College of Charleston. Coach, anything else we need to be aware of as a Citadel family? Anything else you need to tell us before we say I do? 
no, I appreciate y'all having me on. Uh, what our kids have gone through, you know, since March, uh, with everything that's gone on in the world, uh, COVID being the, uh, a huge factor in, in everything that the kids have gone through, you know, being away from each other. And, um, you know, we didn't have a summer together. Uh, everything was done via Zoom. Uh, on March, on March 12th, I didn't know what a Zoom was. And then, and then I got kind of thrown into using it as a daily activity. But, um, but thanks to all the SID alumni, the people watching, uh, they have been nothing but supportive. Uh, we have great leadership. General Walters is amazing uh, in his capacity. I think uh, what he has done with athletics, his supportive athletic, Captain Peluso over in the Commandant's office, uh, great vision. Our testing here is second to none. To I, I would challenge anybody in the country that doesn't have a hospital on campus. Our testing has been amazing. I've been tested five times for the virus. Um, and then, of course, my direct leadership of um, – Coach Capacio, I mean, I think they're way ahead of curve. Y'all can see now with college uh, college football, teams are now trying to schedule games. It's mm -hmm. kind of crazy. Uh, some people are coming in, and, and we were way ahead of that curve. And people are scheduling games for November. Uh, the Air Force Academy is playing two games. They just play Navy and and um, an Army. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think we were we were way ahead of the curve in that whole deal. And uh, and but it was all due to our leadership. You know, it was all due to uh, General Walter saying we're going to play football, we're going to play volleyball, we're going to play soccer. Our soccer team's had has been fantastic, and volleyball had a huge win against Mercer the other day. So, credit those guys. He is Duke Balcom. He enters his sixth year here when we get going with a Bulldog basketball program for this coronavirus season. And coach, thank you again. This wasn't your first time here on the show. Thank you again for your support of Citadel Gray Line, and we'll be rooting for you and all of the basketball players when the season gets up and going. Thanks, John and Jeff, for having me on, and uh, y'all stay healthy. And uh, I just appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, and thank Jeff, you, Duger. Jeff, you thank you me. aren't so e lucky. We have one uh -oh. more small episode of the Citadel next week. We'll be on here for our final okay. fall episode. We'll recap that trip to Army. We'll have a special guest, and we'll just kind of wrap up this very most unusual coronavirus season. We appreciate everybody for tuning us in to Citadel Gray Line. If you want to contact us anytime, you're welcome to do that at citadel at yall.com. And don't forget our telephone number, 843-779-8496. Until we see you all next week again for our sign-off for the fall, John Rawl, thanking you for being a part of Citadel Gray Line.